uh, thank you, thank you everyone for coming to our event. Uh, today we we're talking about connecting the nodes between uh, Europe and Asia. So uh, I'll just quickly um, introduce our com our company, and then uh, we'll go into the startup presentations. But first of all, thanks for hosting us, hosting the event, and thanks for thanks to George for and the temple to for, for helping us to, to organize uh, the event here in Singapore. Um, so what we what we did because of the slight delay, we optimized the agenda a little bit, so we will make uh, shorter presentations and, um, and and probably will just mix the Q and A straight after the the startup pitch. So I'll help you um, ask um, facilitate the conversation if needed. Uh, so my name is Luke uh, Skudler. I'm from a company called World Digital. Uh, we're based in uh, Zurich in Switzerland. Um, we've been working on startup projects and uh, fintech projects for the last uh, three years. And uh, three years we started advising uh, some of the first ICOs from from Switzerland. That was before when uh, when everyone was talking about ICOs and it was all very new. Um, and we worked on some of the first projects uh, out of out of uh, Switzerland, including. Um, maybe you know a company called Lickhead, so that was uh, back then we helped them raise uh, two million dollars, which was a huge raise in, in 20, 2015. Um, in the last uh, three years, we, we kind of grew with the industry and, and we now have a large team, a uh, decentralized team, and we're advised, we are worked on more than 50 projects uh, all over the world. And recently, of course, we, we also Expand and we, we, we and that's why we're in Singapore and in Southeast Asia to look for uh, contacts. We see a lot of uh, companies. We go through a lot of companies that apply to to work with us, to want to work with us, and uh, some of them work on the same stuff, and some of them work on very similar things that we see is happening in other jurisdictions. So we also not only uh, help them with uh, token design um, and tokenomics, how to structure the sale. We also help them uh, connect the dots between other projects. We introduce them to uh, networks, to other projects, and also uh, investors. So that's why we're also here at uh, Consensus and the Blockchain Week. So I think that covers um, what digital. And today we we have we brought with us um, our top companies that we currently work on. Um, they're in different stages, different, different, completely different. Uh, also token designs, some of them are doing utility tokens, others um, security coins. So we'll also, we can talk about it later and look, look at different trends in the industry. But I will, um, I will hand over to the first uh, startup today, uh, Sarah from uh, Flex. Thank you very much. change is the biggest challenge facing humanity right now. We have already all the solutions that we need to solve climate change, but we're not implementing them at scale, and that needs to change. I believe very profoundly uh, that when we're making money out of solving climate change, it will happen. So I am basically focusing my life on helping organizations and individuals make money out of solving climate change. And that's what the Flex Token is all about. So what's the problem with electricity? At the moment, in many countries, we've done very well at bringing renewables into the grid mix. But renewables pose some challenges. Renewables generate when the sun shines and when the wind blows. But at other times, uh, uh, there's a problem. At the same time as we're trying in energy systems to solve climate change, other trends are happening. So we're electrifying far more load with electric vehicles, heat pumps in some markets. Um, also, smart meters are coming in that are providing data that we previously didn't have, and that's driving regulatory change. So instead of settling electricity customers against a the profile, uh, they're now going to be settled against their actual consumption that increases the wholesale risk for electricity retailers. Uh, and finally, renewable power actually creates wholesale risk. 
because when there's lots of renewable power out there, the price sinks, in many markets goes negative. When there isn't anything, when it's scarce, price skyrockets. So that's an opportunity. How do we solve that at the moment? We turn on dirty, polluting uh, power stations. But there is an alternative. By instead creating a lot of flexibility on the customer side and moving that flexible load to match to renewables, we don't have to use those dirty power stations. So a big issue with the dirty power stations is you're paying for renewables, then you also have to pay for the dirty power stations. So as consumers, we pay for two types of generation. That's just crazy. You shouldn't pay for that because profoundly, that's actually making our world more polluted. So our solution is to make customers flexible. So you might wonder what I, what's flexible, what's that all about? So it goes at different levels, at very large industrial commercial customers, it might be big air conditioning load. So for example, a building like this, you can pre-chill the chiller unit, have no impact whatsoever on the comfort uh, of the building, but actually create some uh, thermal storage in that unit. Then when the price spikes, or it's very dirty, you can turn that chiller unit off and still circulate all the cool air so that as occupants, we still enjoy the comfort that we're looking for. That's flexibility. Uh, down to a very different level at your individual home level, for example, your dishwasher. Most of us don't really care when we run that load. Uh, no, we could be out in a bar while it's running. And we could be doing whatever we want to, as long as we have the clean dishes when we actually need them. So that's flexibility. Uh, flexibility is very valuable, but, and this is the, uh, the crucial but, it's very hard for us as customers to access the value of that flexibility because the energy system is so heavily regulated and is essentially uh, stitched up by the incumbency in the fossil fuel industry. So at the Flex Network, what we're doing is we're tokenizing value from outside the energy system to bring it in to customers in the existing energy system. So the, the correlation between carbon intensity and price uh, is enormous, as I've said already. When there's lots of renewables, it's cheap, when it's very uh, expensive, it's dirty. So by predicting the carbon content of the grid using machine learning, uh, we can basically tell when customers should be flexible and therefore create that incentive. So how it works, we have two protocols. We have proof of demand, uh, which is basically the, uh, the, prediction, the prediction. The grid would like you to use energy because renewables are plentiful. So that sends a signal to uh, an Internet of Things device, uh, a building management system, a home energy management system, a smart appliance, the list is endless. Uh, that now you should be using electricity or now you should not be using electricity. Those actions uh, are create, create a proof of delivery uh, uh, protocol uh, and that's how we mint our token. So, we're a dual token system, a utility token. Uh, Flex is a, uh, a payment and utility token. So when you have the, uh, the proof of delivery, it mints a shift token as a payment to customers. Uh, that burns the Flex token. If you want to know, I'm not going to go on and on about this in this presentation, but if you want to find out a little bit more about uh, how this works, please come and see myself and my co-founder Molly, who's just sitting here. Uh, we're just launching uh, a private sale for our ICO. Uh, well, our total supply is 1 billion tokens, and we're planning to sell 35% in the, the ICO. In terms of what we plan to do with the money, most of it's going to be spent on uh, tech development. In terms of the blockchain development, more data scientists for the carbon intensity prediction, but we also have a small amount, 20%, building out this ecosystem. So 
But we're leveraging the work that has been done by the organizations that myself and Molly already run. I run a company called Tempest Energy, which is a machine learning company that's been going for six and a half years in the energy sector. Um, we, we're already in a number of projects that are currently just using our traditional technology stack, but we'll be leveraging those opportunities uh, uh, to, uh, to use the token. Uh, we intend to initially double the size of our team and then we're going to roll this out uh, across different uh, geographies. So although regulation is different in every single country, because this is a, an opportunity that doesn't rely on regulation, we can do this uh, in any different, um, different market. So I've talked already a little bit about um, Tempest Energy. Um, we have a deal with the largest electricity retailer in Australia, Origin Energy. So what I've just described, we're already doing with them. Uh, we're in, for example, the largest sports stadium in South Australia. Uh, we turn their air conditioning chiller unit off and on. We turn their air handling units off and on. Sorry, <laughs> Luke would like me to come a little bit further here, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, we're basically predicting the price of the wholesale market in Australia, which again, remember, that's a proxy for carbon. So we're bringing these customers out of the really expensive periods uh, and pushing them into the cheaper periods, which makes money for their electricity retailer, which they're then sharing with the customer. Um, Energy Unlocked, which is run by Molly, has really been about uh, driving rapid uptake of technologies, helping organizations uh, to scale and really trying to change this, uh, this ecosystem. Uh, the first uh, use of our utility token will be in a project in Sweden uh, where we are tokenizing value for a forklift truck battery manufacturer. Uh, their largest customer is the largest furniture store in Sweden. I think you all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> they use a lot of forklift trucks. Uh, traditionally, forklift trucks will just be charged at the end of the day. That's a really dumb time to charge them. That's often the most expensive period. Actually, those units could be charged at 2 a.m. and they'd still be ready when that uh, uh, furniture manufacturer wants to move their stock around. So it's about really using all of this uh, latent uh, uh, storage in a more sensible way. Um, Energy Unlocked has been working on uh, a flexibility project for London, which the London Mayor has supported, uh, and we also intend to, uh, to tokenize value in that project. So what we're doing here is building a new ecosystem, capturing that ecosystem early. This stuff is not happening fast enough because people are not being rewarded for it in the existing system. So for example, you go and think, you know, you think about you want to buy a new dishwasher. You can choose a very smart one, which is more expensive, or you can choose a dumb one, which isn't. If there's no value to be obtained from it, of course, you choose the cheaper one because you've got better things to do with your cash. What this token will do is make that appliance a revenue opportunity. Because every time you run it, based on uh, the prediction, you'll mint shift. Now shift for a customer can be used to reduce your energy bill, can be used to buy different things. So initially, I think we're all aware that ordinary people are perhaps not converted to crypto yet. So you need to convert that value in a way that they actually understand. So there's quite a lot of flexibility in that conversion to make it meaningful for customers. So capturing this uh, ecosystem early is going to be incredibly valuable. This is the commodity demand flexibility because it's so needed for making these systems uh, work in a cost-effective way. So I've spent a lot of time trying to uh, incentivize this. Uh, we're in Australia because it's the best electricity market design in the world. You can, when, uh, when regulation works against you, uh, you've got lots of different options for how you react. You can sit around and whinge about it, 
I confess I have done that. Uh, you can take legal action against it. Uh, I've also done that. Uh, in November, um, a composition law case, which we ran, which we launched in 2014 in the European Court, will get its judgment. If we win, and it's still a big if, but if we win, we will have removed four billion pounds of fossil fuel subsidies in the UK already committed, stopped a future 10 billion pounds of fossil fuel subsidies in the UK, and stopped 40 to 50 billion euros of future fossil fuel subsidies. So not a bad day's work, I would say. But I am more excited about this token uh, than the things that I have done uh, so far because it has the potential to create massive rapid uptake. You imagine, first of all, it will be maybe 10 dishwashers, and then 10,000, then a million, then 10 million, then 100 million. And what happens at the moment is when regulation is constructed, the fossil fuel industry sits in the room and says, flexible customers, they don't exist. We don't need to design these regulations for these fictitious uh, organizations or people. They don't exist. And therefore, of course, regulation doesn't include customers. But when a million, 10 million, 100 million dishwashers have been flexing daily and that immutable proof is on a blockchain, Molly and I will be having very different conversations with regulators. Because when the fossil industry says they don't exist, we'll say, but hang on a minute. What about all this evidence? What about all these guys actually already doing it, already ensuring that renewables uh, are being supported? And they're not really going to have very much to say about that. And for me, that's one of the big reasons why blockchain is so important, uh, because you actually create that immutable proof. So it's about tokenizing value from outside the energy system, bringing it in, and actually creating that proof. So if any of you out there are interested in making money out of saving this beautiful planet of ours, uh, please come and talk to me. Thank you very much. I think we can open for questions uh, now. I think this is... Does anyone have any questions? Stunned into silence. <laughs> That's usually a good thing, I always think. Uh, why do you need blockchain to, ex uh, to exist? Like, what is the... So, I, mean, I think for me it is the, uh, the immutable proof. You have no idea how many conversations or how many rooms I've sat in having these conversations. Uh, and the fossil industry is not wrong. At the moment, these customers don't exist. But that's why it's so important to, uh, to build them. What sort of um, I mean, feedback you have from Asia and uh, from Singapore and the region? You know, so far, very, very positive. I mean, cities like Singapore already have a lot of technology installed. These are already incredibly uh, technology-enabled cities. Because the cheapest way to build flexibility is by going in through uh, existing systems. So there are loads and loads of buildings here that already have really sophisticated building management systems. So then you can just go in through a software route and leverage the, the um, existing functionality. You know, that's not the case in uh, many places outside Asia. So that's a real benefit here. Sorry, yes? OK, I, I, I got a question. Sure. I deal with regulators all the time. <laughs> right. And a lot of regulators are actually being controlled by fossil fuel bags. <laughs> so how do you deal with that? Because that's a barrier to any kind of technological adoption that we have in renewables. And since you are bringing them to court <laughs> quite painfully, <laughs> I'm just wondering how do you deal oh, with that? It's not being painful, I'm really enjoying it. For them. Oh. <laughs> not for you, for them. <laughs> no, I, I, I may not be winning the popularity stakes with that industry. But I think this, and again, this is where uh, blockchain is so important, because there's kind of a carrot and a stick aspect of this. Because regulators, a lot of them actually do want to change, but they're not exactly brave. So if you can show that this is a resource they can rely on, they're more likely to, uh, to create regulation that supports it. 
but there is also uh, the stick because basically if there are a million 10 million 100 million smart dishwashers out there that means there is a million 10 million 100 million voters who actually think hey great idea to be making money out of my dishwasher so are you going to vote for a politician that says stuff you you can't have this cash or are you going to vote for the woman or, or guy who says, hey, this is a really great idea, let's change regulations so you earn more out of your dishwasher? I think that's quite compelling. Thank you. Pleasure. Yes? I thank you, Sarah, for sharing such a great vision. I think the trick will be how to make it stepwise, uh, how to introduce it really in the world. So what is your approach on the technical level? Is it really to go to a large consortium, like the one you mentioned, and get the proof of concept there that really this uh, whole information loop is already working or do you seek active consumers who you hook in your form for example via an app and they change their behavior manually so to say so that they say okay today I, I shift my behavior and uh, and your blockchain is just noticing their change of behavior which they did by, by purpose so I uh, I'm not a big believer in uh, getting people to act I think if you've installed the initial technology which automates all of this, you've already done your bit. All of us have busy lives. We shouldn't have to be energy traders or carbon traders on top of going to work, looking after our family, etc., etc. So our technology stack is a fully automated uh, tech stack. So in terms of rollout, what we've been doing as, uh, as Tempus is going to building management system companies. Uh, doing the initial uh, tech development to connect in, and then any customer you have, let's go talk to them. Uh, and the retailer who we have our deal with in Australia, Origin Energy, is massively facilitating that. Uh, but we're now starting to talk to smart appliance manufacturers uh, who want to sell product, battery manufacturers who want to sell product, pool pump manufacturers who want to sell product. This is basically, take your marketing budget, put it into a token to motivate this initial build out. Once you've done that initial investment as an appliance manufacturer, uh, you can actually pull value out of these markets and therefore you create this uh, self-sustaining revenue source. So, so far we've had some very promising conversations with all of those uh, types of organizations. So the outlook is like you have an existing business and you can bring an added value to these companies within the existing regulations, but once you have proof and once leg uh, legislations would change, then you would have a much faster scale up. So initially, a lot of them, so for example, dishwashers, you can't access any of these schemes, whereas you should be able to. Uh, but um, let's say LG, uh, they would like to be able to aggregate a million dishwashers. But first of all, they actually have to, to sell them. So it's worthwhile for them to put some of their marketing budget into funding this token because that starts people buying these units. Once you have a certain number, you can aggregate into existing revenue streams. Then this becomes the self-fulfilling uh, loop. So that's why they're keen to, uh, to access this. Because these organizations uh, desperately want to sell products. I mean, smart appliances are quite an interesting technology, but why would we buy them unless there's something in it for us? So that's what the, that's the problem we're solving there for them, which is why they're interested. Yeah. Hi, uh, it's a great vision, and I love the concept. Uh, on the adding to this question earlier, uh, what do you do about appliances or devices which have already been installed in houses or buildings? Sure. Or, uh, so it's possible to use a uh, a smart plug on those devices. So my own dishwasher in the UK uh, used to come on in the middle of the night linked to oversupply of wind in Scotland because actually that sends the market negative. So you think about a business model where electricity is negative. From a, a fossil fuel unit owner, obviously that's terrible. But from you and I, that's like someone paying me to do my dishes. That's fucking amazing. So those kind of getting the, the install, it's a little bit more challenging with those because you've got to drive that uptake. So we're talking to a number of them to simplify that process of installation uh, and, and make that happen because I think that's one of the reasons why this will happen so quickly because you can spend 
20 bucks on uh, a smart plug and start making money. But on the, on the business side, the effort is completely different. So instead of going to LG, you will have to go to individual customers or some, I don't know, some resellers or something. So it depends a little bit because the, the BMS manufacturers, uh, they're on maintenance contracts. Oh, yeah. So actually it's in their interest uh, uh, to go back and reconnect with customers. You have to understand, the thing I said at the beginning, uh, I am focusing all my effort on how you make money out of this ship. So every opportunity for someone else to make money, they are gonna be motivated to do this. So that's kind of how I spend my time. Sorry, a smart Sorry. plug, is it expensive? Well, they're about, th they're about $20. Oh, okay. So I mean, that's probably the investment. Okay. Have you, have you already been talking to these uh, appliance manufacturers already, like LG? Yes. What are the brands that are supporting the protocol right now? So, Bosch, uh, we're, having, we're quite far down the uh, conversation with Bosch and with LG. So there, we started off basically looking at who has what, what's easiest to integrate with, what are they selling, where are they selling, and so on, that's driven that. So, we're also having conversations with pool pump manufacturers in Australia, uh, and then smaller aircon uh, um, organization, aircon uh, um, manufacturers. You're talking to the LG, you're talking to the South Korea, or you're talking to the local office? So, kind of long story, but because uh, everything is connected and everything you do in the past, if you uh, treat people in the right way, uh, they kind of help you along. So, uh, uh, Korea's uh, UK trade ambassador uh, used to be the member of parliament. Uh, uh, who ran the Climate Change Committee. He actually hated the fossil fuel scheme that, uh, that we are legally challenging. Long story short, he's connected us into uh, Korea at a very high level. So some, some advantages that you don't kind of realize at the time and then they come back and get you a few years later, which is great. So. One more question, Patrick. Well, where, where do you foresee the, the token to be Use, I mean, other than being converted into other cryptos or fiat, do you, do you intend to build an ecosystem for your specific term? Um, so, there's two aspects of the, um, the, uh, the, the process that could bring in other partners. So, the proof of demand, at the moment, uh, Tempest will do that prediction. We're already doing uh, predictions on both carbon and price, but there's no reason why other machine learning companies couldn't come in and, and do that. And then in terms of uh, proof of delivery, we envisage that to be really wide because we want to build this to be uh, as big as possible. So actually, maybe LG uh, want to do that themselves. We're not going to force uh, a, a technology usage on them because the whole purpose of this is we want this token to be used as much as possible to push up the value of the token. So the, the, the investors in the token make as much money as possible. Cool. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, Sarah is here. If you have any more questions, you can ask her after the presentation. So the next one up is uh, Marco from Silent. Uh, thank you. So, similar problem. Uh, we're from Silent. We. Swiss company, and we want to get rid of the CO2 problem. We're convinced that we have a serious issue to solve. We are depending from fossil fuel still. We are putting tons and tons of CO2 into the air each year still. And we're creating massive problem to our environment. So it's not only the sad polar bear that has troubles. We're getting our troubles. Switzerland is here. We had a terrible summer. Everything was dry. There were plants dry, dying. To never have ever seen these trees dying. So it's uh, something is really changing. So now. We see that in 2015, there was a really big, important step when 196 nations decided to 
uh, reduce the CO2 emission to zero by 2050. The problem is that 30 years, it's not enough to do that. And knowing that it won't be possible, we have to start to act now. This actually is not something that I wrote on the picture, which was actually on the Eiffel Tower in Paris in that year. So we have to act now, we have to do something. Now, we are a company that was already thinking about a solution since 12 years. And our founder found a solution, and this is the use of methanol. Now methanol, somebody maybe knows what it is, other has heard about it. Just simply say it's the simplest form of alcohol. It can be made only synthetically, so it doesn't exist in nature. And more important, it can be produced with atmospheric CO2. So you can use the CO2 who is in the atmosphere, or better the CO2 who is going in the atmosphere, to make alcohol. Now, why do we use, want to use this methanol, and later we'll explain what we do with the methanol. First, it's clean and clear. It's not oil that spills out of the, of the soil. It's, it's, it's really like somewhat the can imagine an alcohol is. It burns clean. It's just water vapor coming out. Other CO2, for this we'll explain, does it will be CO2 neutral. So basically, you can put some eucalyptus on the exhaust of a system burning methanol and make inhalation. It's not dangerous at all. It's easy to handle. You just can use the same infrastructure to distribute the fuel, so it's, it's a liquid, it's easy to handle, it's biodegradable, means it's harmless for the environment. So you have an accident with a ship carrying methanol, it's only the couple of, of fishes in the first one minute in the water maybe die, and then this methanol binds with water and you have no problems at all. So there's no nasty pictures of pelicans that are black and they will never get in normal life again. So it's really a, a, a fuel that it's safe and easy to handle. It's the second most traded liquid worldwide. The reason that it's used to make plastic. You don't want to use it to make plastic, basically. But actually it's a liquid that is used really on a massive scale. There's a massive market. Now, from the point of view to using as fuel, because we are convinced that uh, with all respect to the battery solution that existing coming up to the solar and wind, a fuel-based solution still is needed and will be needed for a long time. You see what mankind has made with the fuels. Well, first wood, where's the advantage that was burning, then someone found a better solution for another coal burns too. It's higher, at a higher energy density, it burns longer, it's better to handle. Then we find out oil. And actually it's the position we have now. So for what if you consider uh, liquid fuels, we are at the technological level of oil. But as Shaik Saki Amani said in just after the oil crisis in 74, that Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. So we won't run out of oil and then decide what we can use. We have to find something better. And the thing, the fuel that is better is methanol. It's environmental friendly, CO2 neutral. It can be non CO2 neutral. The actual methanol, methanol isn't, but we will do it CO2 neutral. And we have an unlimited uh, availability because it can be done synthetically. So we don't have to dig in the ground to find. Now, I say we are an established company. We started 12 years ago to make a system that used methanol to make energy. 
that will, we have many power plants that is in place since two years that use methanol to heat up buildings to make energy to cover these energy gaps that are in the grids. So we are not the nasty diesel generators who make the third energy. We make this, uh, this energy in clean form. And these are products we are already developed. So we are a company that uh, is already in place since 12 years. We are searching on other systems that use methanol. But now with this project, we want to start the counterpart of the ecosystem. We want to make the part that produces CO2 neutral methanol for our system and also to be sold as CO2 neutral methanol. Because CO2 neutral methanol isn't present on the market on a massive scale and it's a really neat. So you can use it to make energy with our system, but you can also use it to make plastics. And make CO2 neutral plastic is something more actually everybody wants to do. And if you want to, uh, you can use methanol in the automotive industry to blend it with gas. And there is a massive need for CO2 neutral uh, additive in the automotive industry. Now what we do is make this part, and for this reason we are making this ICO. Our first step, explained before, it was to make this plant that is in place since two years. It's the first plant of that, that size worldwide that uses methanol, make electricity heat and cold. It's a service since summer 2016. It's rubber free, remote operated. And this plan will be part of a future decentralized system to make energy in the form for elect of electricity, of heat, and coal. So we will have a grid of mini power plants that will react maybe on uh, analysis made by the system of flex. It's, it's absolutely possible to cover the energy needs on the right moment. So what we are doing is close the gap of this ecosystem of local energy supply by doing synthetic methanol. We need to make our own methanol for this system and we need to make CO2 neutral methanol available everywhere. Methanol can be easily made. You take CO2, you take water, heat and power, and you have methanol. You don't have to mix it, they have catalytic system, but they're well-known systems. It's an ideal system to store surplus energy. So the, in Switzerland in summer, they heat up rails with solar energy because it's wasted energy. They don't know what to do with that. And yet, it's one form to use this energy on, in a good way is to make methanol out of it. We can use the existing infrastructure. We can use the trucks that carry up liquid uh, fuels for the transport of methanol. And you can make methanol out of atmospheric CO2. So what we are looking with this RCO is to fund methanol synthesis plants. Now, why we are using the blockchain to fund a plant? We are convinced that in our ecosystem we have a lot of users of the blockchain. What we first need to build the system that can use the blockchain to make a CO2 neutral uh, energy a cycle or ecosystem. So we're convinced that we have to make a first, almost simple step, a found um, company that makes CO2 neutral methanol by using the blockchain with a security token. Our token 
gives the revenue of the company back to the token holders. So it's generating its own liquidity each year. The token gives back one third of the company once the company has an exit. So we're giving a participation to the people holding the token from the company to the token holders. That's for us really important that the people that are holding the token take advantage of our success. This is also the, the way we think that this is a case of a stable and safe token because it's backed by an existing company with 12 years of experience and it's backed on a technology <coughs> that is worldwide uh, known and proof. Now, what are the advantages of our token? We can expect, the best case, 15 to 20 percent per annum of revenue or return of investment. We have a low expected volatility of the token. We are convinced that it's not trade centric. We think that will be traded, but by generating the liquidity by itself, so you get liquidity from the token itself, you don't need to trade it. It's not so important on how much exchange it will be traded. And it has a really attractive, attractive payment at the end. So if you see it on a, on a timeline with a bit of longer than what is usual uh, to think in the blockchain environment, it's a really good investment case. We think also that our token is stable, like a lighthouse, just in this time, we, are not, we don't want to be in the boat on the ocean outside in these bullish times, but we want to be in the lighthouse. So Swiss case, existing company, it's backed with a lot of experience, with the experience of almost 40 years in, in this sector. So our founder is working since 40 years on the development of ideas, and we have, with the other company, almost uh, already raised 35 millions on equity for research and development of several solutions. We also have won uh, several awards. There's a couple of them, but we also have a Swiss Innovation Award being the best product of the year in 2016. Now what, what's our timeline? We are now in pre-sale. We expect January 2019 to go in public sale. And the markets are not so good, so we hope that it will, uh, will be that date. And end of 2019, beginning of 2020, we have the first plant under construction. And end 2020, beginning 2021, we have the first million liters of M99. That's a brand we have own to define the CO2 neutral methanol. We expect that end 2020, the first million will be produced. You see, methanol, it's good for our ecosystem, but it's also a good case, a business case, as a product. There's a massive growth in China, for example, in the use of methanol. And the revenues we can generate by selling this methanol or producing this methanol also in Asia are really huge. So we have a good case. And we're also convinced that we can use the blockchain in this project. We need first to make a security token to fund the project, but we surely will use the blockchain, for example, to ensure that the CO2 neutral steps in the production of methanol are really, uh, correctly done. We don't even to make a token for that. You just have to use the blockchain because it's there and can be used. 
So now uh, I think uh, that's the end of my presentation. We have every information on our website. You're invited to contact us. And uh, I'm open for questions. If you want, yes. So uh, maybe let me have with the mic, maybe yeah. Yeah. so other people can hear. Thank you. Um, sorry, so you mentioned this is more of a security token, right? Yeah. So, um, but I think you didn't really explain the tokens for the security tokens. What is packed into for silent? That is, what does it based on? Does it based on the pricing of the methanol, or does it based on the factory um, property price? Um, what is what does it pack on? No, it's, pre it's, it's based. The revenue came from the the, the, the sales of the methanol. Okay. So they want to, the the revenue get back on the on the on the on the, on the claiming, claiming process you have once per year. Okay, so it's based on the how much methanol yes. you sold and the, the, we reflect back on the yeah. token. The so this token is it based on ERC twenty? Yes, it's 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 an ERC twenty. It was the, when we started, it was the idea to use it. Okay, then same. that means you be on a normal decentralized exchange. Yes, that means people can just trade it all over they want. Yes, but the problem with the exchange, they have to understand how this token works, and now we need really uh, the exchanges that can do that and. We are talking with a couple of exchanges, and um, maybe we start with one. Okay, because First. I'm trying to figure out, because if it's an ERC20 token, right? Yeah. That means any other exchange can just pick up your token, no. since it's a public token? No, you, you can do it, but you have, to reflect, you have to reflect the content of the smart contract. And it's different than um, other utility tokens. So that the problem that if it's ERC20, doesn't mean that it can be traded from the, from the Kind of a structure of the of the data of the exchange. That's the that's the biggest problem. At least I heard. I'm not a technician to, okay. to say that. But uh, maybe let me add something to it. Uh, since it's packed to revenues of the company, it's also security, um, yeah. and this is why the exchange where you trade it needs to be regulated. Right. And uh, depending on the jurisdiction yeah. where you're in, uh, you cannot just go to any exchange. But it needs to be security regulated exchange that trades security tokens. So the, the legal issue is, is, is another point. Yes, I, was I mean, I can I can answer this because I mean we have for the for the security tokens you, 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 the problem is you can't freely uh, move them around on blockchain. So uh, the people who um, will obtain the token later, they also have to go through the same exact the same uh, sign up KYC and AML process that the uh, token initial token buyers went through. So we, we have a. We have a solution for, for silent to also um, put them on an exchange. Um, and it's a bit of a hack at the moment, but it's, we have an exchange, fairly big exchange that's interested to do that, and they already do it with another security token. Basically, they white we have to whitelist the uh, Ethereum addresses. I think that's the current solution, because we get a lot of questions from investors, you know, what, what about liquidity? Uh, so that's the solution. Uh, it's a bit awkward, but at least they can sell it. They can move it to other uh, buyers. Um, I'm sure you know we see so much interest from from security tokens, uh, and different setups, equity, uh, and so on. So I think this will be this will definitely there will be a more practical solution in the future. I'm sure. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or more? Like you have more questions? I, I can think of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Feel free to yeah, yeah. Ask. yeah. Okay. Any more questions to Marco? I, I have one. Um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm not really too familiar with uh, CO2 neutral methanol, but is CO2 neutral necessary to replace regular fossil fuel in cars? Is that the reason why? No, but okay, uh, yeah. uh, if we want to replace completely the fuel, uh, it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, it can be done. So neutral it means that we, we, we don't reduce the global CO2, but we don't put more CO2 in the air. So it's, uh, because uh, they need to be burned uh, and easy to handle, uh, you have, it's a mix-up. So if you use hydrogen, uh, it's, a, a, it's better than CO2 neutral because you don't, uh, uh, you don't put CO2 again in the, in the air. But uh, hydrogen is really difficult to handle. So the first fuel you can use with a high a hydrogen density, but it's liquid, it's methanol. And if you just burn it, you can buy methanol from Qatar, but it's made by fossil. 
it's no problem. So if you just want to use methanol, you can buy it. But then you, you introduce CO2 in the air more than there was before. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is to, to uh, make a neutral, we are slightly new, uh, negative because when you, when you make the meth uh, methanol, you use more CO2 than later it's released when it's burned. But you, if you want to use methanol as 100% fuel, it can be done, but there are um, a lot of, of things that you need to do on, on the engines. We have rumors that the, the Germans are trying to build a methanol engine. It's quite new, new, so for the cars, but we still don't have the details on that. Any more questions? There's one at the back. Hi, Marco. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I still have some doubts that your product is going to be uh, more environment friendly than the standard methanol, but my question is a little bit different. Yeah, okay. um, how much the volume of methanol your company is able to produce, and why is it going to be cheaper to buy your product rather than traditional methanol it's for certain users? It won't be cheaper. If you, if you sell CO2 neutral methanol, you can sell it at double the price. So it's going to be twice? No, that's a market price. So there are people who are ready to buy, uh, to pay this price because they don't want to put, uh, to use fossil made methanol. So the, the use of methanol, if you, uh, if you... So when you're talking about people, uh, is it going to be just random, uh, random users no, 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 no. or uh, any kind of corporations that gonna no, no. agree already buy your product? Yes, no, that's that, that's an industrial need. So, if you if you put this product on the on, on the market, CO2 neutral methanol, there is a need for that. So the automotive industry, if you buy the premium gas, so you get you have the regular 50, uh, 95 octane gas, and you you buy the 98 octane gas, it's cost a couple of cents more. That's methanol. It's just to make it a little bit more. I guess. Better. I guess the question is, you know, you wouldn't have a problem if you had this plant tomorrow. You wouldn't have a problem no. to sell methanol. No, no, no. You just put it out, and it's it's you. You sell everything. I don't think you have this. How much can you produce per year? I don't know. I, so you can ask. Can Andreas ask him. He's, he's the guy who can tell you that. Andreas is from the also business side, so you can ask him all the difficult questions about the business plan. Any more questions about the Marco? No? Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. The next one is uh, BX, so a betting exchange from, from Malta. So we have Gibro. Uh, Thank you, Luke. That was meant to be the panel. Did you send your slides on time? It's not a deck. No, I'm just enough. No. Let me, uh, she probably has a second Can we start deck. about the deck? And then yeah, sure. Yeah, just do the introduction and we'll organize it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, also, a warm welcome from my side. Um, I'm Gabriel, a founding partner of Growth Chain Ventures. That's a uh, blockchain focused venture capital firm based in Malta and we are part of a larger group of uh, funds which initially did uh, non-blockchain investments in the iGaming and fintech space but now moving more into the blockchain area and uh, one of the companies that our group has made an investment in is BXBet which I'll be presenting to you today um, thank you um, which I'll be presenting today where we made a seed investment in with our group and uh, So BXPAT is a decentralized exchange for any kind of betting and prediction markets. Uh, you can imagine it as a marketplace or a, a platform where all kinds of participants can come together and uh, make predictions on anything that has a limited, objectively measurable outcome, uh, which doesn't necessarily need to be limited to sports events, but can be anything that you can think of. Before I go into the details, uh, just to give you an idea about the market that BXPAT is it, uh, active in. Uh, Betting in general, it's a very large market. It has been growing year over year, um, disregarding any kind of financial crisis or other um, uh, events that are happening. It's something that's happening socially as well. It's something that's happening in offices uh, amongst group of friends. And this is just the market size for the legal regulated market. 
It doesn't include uh, markets which are black markets where something is happening uh, really out of uh, legal jurisdictions uh, and has been growing uh, in a very stable manner. And this doesn't even include the recent uh, US Supreme Court decision uh, which banned um, the um, sports betting ban that was existing where you have now more and more states like New Jersey which are coming online and becoming really attractive markets uh, for the betting industry. Um, but even with all this growth and the large market size, about, uh, it's more than 50 billion uh, US dollars of markets, um, there's still a huge problem in the industry. And this is based on the nature of the business actually, where you have on the one hand companies that can only make money if the customers that are betting lose money. This is a problem which is not related only to one single operator, one single company, but it's a general uh, occurrence. And usually in most cases, on average, uh, most people will lose their money over time, which is the same like in a casino. So um, what happens though is there is certain people that are successful in a manner, but as you can imagine, if you're a company that profits only by customers losing money, you'll start to think of creative ways, probably still legal ways, but try to make it more difficult for a person to bet on certain outcomes. It is completely legal according to the terms and conditions to limit players that are winning, to tell them, hey, you cannot bet on football anymore, you cannot do that anymore, or you cannot bet more than 50 euros anymore. So this way they hatch their uh, downside, and for the user it's a, actually very bad experience as well. Apart from that, there are certain trust issues. You have to fund your account with a credit card or with some other method, so the money leaves your account, goes to a certain uh, party which you don't know what's happening, in most cases, there is a regulatory oversight over these companies, but once you want to get your money out again, if you want, there is still a process which is quite tedious. You have to wait one week, then there is something like a KYC process suddenly coming out again because they have to do some additional checks. So overall, it's a very complicated structure. And if you look at what the expat tries to do in this market is apply the basic principles of blockchain to have a decentralized system, which is also done in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, meaning you don't bet or play against the central authority, but it's an open marketplace where you do peer-to-peer -peer, um, betting against other people. So imagine an office pool where you're just betting on the Oscars or any other event. It's taking this experience onto the blockchain and making it accessible uh, for the, the complete market. And it's also not limited in scope. It can be anything, covering anything. And um, due to the peer-to-peer -peer nature, it's also fair with always up-to-date, minute-to-minute, second-to-second um, uh, fair prices which reflects the actual market similar to a normal exchange. Um, so instead of an exchange which has uh, cryptocurrencies as an underlying, you have spe specific markets where you trade outcomes, which says there is a buy and a sell market for an event happening or not happening. And this way, um, you actually give the user a much better user experience. And using a wallet where you have your tokens, which are then transferred to the market, there is not, uh, not any single point in time where your money actually leaves your own uh, possession, where it's just in the market and then paid out again to the people that were betting on the certain outcomes. Now, it's not going to be limited to the sports markets, which I mentioned earlier. Um, to give you an idea about what else can be done um, on a prediction market, it can be about any kind of financial market events. Uh, it can be about the best performer at Shanghai Stock Exchange tomorrow, it can be about uh, whether ETH or BTC be the, will be the better performer tomorrow, or about the uh, ETH price uh, next week, if it will cross $300, yes or no. Anything where you can think of potential outcomes which are limited in scope and are measurable in an objective manner. You can create a market, you can be the market owner, you can provide the liquidity, but you can have all other people join into the market as well to create their own markets. And um, apart from that, you can even go so far as um, saying it's going to rain tomorrow in Singapore, yes or no, um, and many other aspects. It might sound trivial, but in the end, this will become also a crowdsourcing tool for any kind of statistical uh, occurrences. It can be even about um, prices, it can be about energy prices um, uh, for decentralized uh, networks. There's going to be virtual power plants as well, which are uh, uh, planning, and this way you can actually hedge your electricity generation because in a prediction market, as long as there's a market and a depth to the liquidity, you can do anything you want with it, as long as it's somehow covered by any kind of counterparty in that sense. So the bigger the market, the bigger the um, community, the larger the opportunities will be, and it will be completely decentralized, which means we leave it to the community to develop the actual front-end applications to it, and also the type of markets they want to create. 
Now, um, I'll briefly touch on certain advantages of the platform. We mentioned already some, uh, which is the uh, transparency of the market, fair prices, but um, uh, in addition, there is also much lower fees. The prices will be up to 4%, depending on certain criteria, which is roughly half of what you're paying at traditional uh, bookmakers or traditional operators. Apart from that, there is also a social betting aspect to it. Now, if you want to actually take the real office pool uh, experience into BXBet, you can do that free of charge. As long as it's a private market with only limited people who are invited to the market, there will be no fees charged at all. To make also sure that um, you have some kind of activity which you can do as long as you don't open it to the public. Once you open it to the public, there will be a fee which will be up to 4%, um, which will be covering the development of the platform, which will give some ref share to the market owner based on the liquidity and the activity of the market. And also, um, there will be front-end developers. As I mentioned earlier, BXBet is not going to be a central place. It's just a showcase where people come to BXBet. But the actual action will be happening at different uh, integrations of BXBet into, let's say, a blog about um, a football, a news portal about energy. And there you can integrate snippets with an open API connection to the market. So the liquidity in the market will be accessible to anybody who can link up to the market. And there will be a ref share also provided to these front-end applications or uh, providers that uh, make sure that there is certain access to the liquidity provided by the expert. Now, looking at the market owner aspect of it, if you open up a market, you own the market, whether integrated in your own portal, news portal, um, your mobile app, wherever you want to integrate it. And it will give you an overview, which is very similar to an exchange, actually, uh, for other traditional products which you might know. There will be fluctuating price just because it's based on always supply and demand for certain buy and sell side um, systems. And um, this way you can see here that um, you'll also have an order book. Sorry, you'll have an order book um, where you'll know the depth of the market, meaning you can see how the market is positioned for certain um, outcomes. There will always be lower volumes on the actual prices. And uh, as you might know from uh, normal financial markets, there will be much more liquidity available as uh, more you go apart from each buy and sell price, which is at the moment the spot price. Um, all of this will be powered through the BX token. It's an Ethereum ERC20 token, uh, which will make sure that um, you can place your bets from inside your BX wallet directly to the market, or um, also pay out the winnings. Uh, additionally, the outcomes of these games, they will not be sourced from a centralized authority where you get data from, but the target is to have also that outsourced through an oracle system where, we, uh, where there will be an outcome vote and um, the 4% will also cover this outcome voting system through the oracle. There will be a two-tiered system with super users and the community oh. voting and in both instances it has to be a super majority of 70% to confirm the outcome of the actual um, underlying market. There is an exchange demo which you can just uh, try out. It's available in 10 different languages, uh, including Chinese as well, where you can just um, see how this works, uh, what you have to do, what the market uh, will look like. And additionally, there is an MVP out there. It's uh, on the test net at the moment, deployed, uh, where you can uh, just get 20,000 tokens into your account and just play around with the available market. I think at the moment it's by a Munich game, uh, which you can uh, play on. But it will just give you an idea how the system works um, and um, how the mechanics of the platform uh, will be like. Um, the private sale just started two weeks ago. Um, we kicked it off here in Asia. Um, if you want to know more about the actual uh, participation opportunities, because we'll have some restrictions uh, due to legal reasons, feel free to come over and uh, we'll be uh, able to help you out. But 6% um, of the token sale will be um, used for the crowd sale. And of that, we'll have 50% uh, making sure that the platform is developed. Our hard cap is at 20 million. Um, it's value which might not compare to the higher uh, targets which I've seen in some other projects, but being decentralized in nature and using a um, crowd-sourced uh, community where you have all kinds of front-end applications, I think going for a much larger investment will be also just wasting investors' money and it's something which the project really doesn't need. And with 20 million you have really um, a performing base product which we already um, uh, envisioned and uh, created uh, internally. Um, which you can use to make sure that there is actual applications which can build on top of it and it will be building up over time, over the next years, where you can uh, find additional applications uh, for the system. The token sale, um, as an important point, will be uh, done out of Malta. 
Um, the expat is based in Malta as well. There is two main reasons for it. Uh, on the one hand, Malta has a very strong history in the online uh, gaming space and legalized online gaming. There is a regulatory authority, the MGA, uh, where you have to be registered and licensed. And being uh, part of the European Union and the free movement of capital and services, being based in Malta, you can uh, directly approach the complete uh, European market, including Germany, UK, France, and Italy. So there is the huge advantage of being the center, uh, attracting a lot of companies that set up their headquarters in Malta in the online betting space. But apart from that, just recently, Malta has been on the forefront of legislation in the blockchain space, providing a framework for legalized and completely um, regulated uh, issuances of ICOs. They are called BFAs in Malta, virtual financial assets. And um, there is a very clear route and um, actually even for non-legal people, uh, I didn't study anything in the legal sense, but uh, it was very uh, understandable and very easy to read uh, as a piece of legislation. Uh, which will make sure that um, anything that the expect does with their token sales is completely regulated in the European Union uh, country's environment. Um, apart from that, uh, for us, uh, one of the main reasons to invest in the expect was the team behind it as well. Of course, apart from the uh, very interesting market opportunity, um, there's a team that is already coming from the industry. Um, there is um, no one with less than 10 years, in most cases even more than 10 years of experience in the industry. Uh, some of them uh, brought the first um, online betting uh, events to television. Um, some of them founded other uh, operators like Daniel, for example. Uh, he was a uh, founder of Mobilebet, which was uh, sold to the Cherry Group. And uh, apart from that, also a lot of other uh, members who have experience in traditional bookmakers where they actually know the shortcomings and the difficulties um, for the operator, but especially for the customers. Uh, where they know the main pain points of these operators and to transfer that to the blockchain um, uh, space and to make sure that there is a very fair, open um, alternative to the traditional operators. Um, quickly looking at the advisors on board, uh, we'll have Dr. Joseph Bork, uh, who is um, the person at the moment at Malta uh, when it comes to advising uh, ICOs. Uh, he supported the government in the drafting of the uh, legal framework as well. Uh, he's an very enthusiastic blockchain, uh, uh, privately very enthusiastic blockchain fan uh, himself. And uh, he is uh, also from his background uh, in the iGaming space. So he worked uh, with companies uh, going through the legislation and regulatory processes to get them um, licensed in Malta. So we'll have actually both bases covered. On the one hand, having an official uh, on board uh, will support us with the regulatory side of things for the online betting industry but also someone uh, who's able to provide us guidance on the ICO um, side of things. If you have any further questions, um, you can contact me on WeChat as well. Um, we'll have a website uh, which is up and running uh, with um, also white paper in 10 different languages. Um, if there's any other questions, we'll be still around um, at this party or I think over the next days at some other event. So feel free to just get back to me. And if you have a little bit of time left for questions, uh, yeah, absolutely, we have very time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, maybe I can ask you how will you how, how will you deal with uh, moderation of different bets? Because I know uh, when we manage uh, the community, we have a lot of questions uh, because there has been a lot of controversy of people betting on you know the future of Trump, what will happen to him, and uh, how can you do that in a decentralized? Well, um, being really decentralized means that you. Um, know what you're standing for when you say decentralized. That also means, uh, in a way, not having central authority that can limit it, but have a community that governs it. Um, I think there will be a very big self-interest of the community as well to have markets that make sense. There will be clear-cut um, uh, guidelines uh, where it is already clear from the start that anything that is somehow not legal or that is uh, promoting illegal activities uh, will not be tolerated and will not be allowed. There will be penalty on these markets. Uh, the stakes which are on the market will be uh, completely deleted. And the person who's owning the market, this is why we have a market owner structure, there will be always someone who is responsible for a market. It will not be a case um, where anybody can do something without any repercussions, but you'll have to stake a certain amount into the market first as a liquidity provider, similar to a market maker and the traditional uh, stock markets. And that person will also have his own self-interest to make sure that, that it's not a market which might be interpreted as something illegal. But apart from that, we really want to give the community the chance to um, play with the creativity and come up with different markets. 
And if we find out there's something wrong, we will, of course, also intervene. But um, I think apart from first use cases where some people might want to do something funny, uh, I believe that the community will be able to regulate themselves as well. Sorry, one question. Like the Oracle system is probably the most sensitive system because there should be someone who is fetching the data to the system to determine the results, right? So you mentioned that there is an Oracle system and also the community working system to confirm the results. Can you elaborate a little bit which type of service are you using? Is this your Oracle? So we are using all the third party provider which will empower your uh, like, like set up this application. And also, do you see any risks with the community voting? Because it always comes with some risks. Dependent which type of so there's like this can be mismatch how the token own ownership and also how many community members are participating on the on the bed. So so if the it's possible that a majority better is the one person, but because there are many many community members who are but on the other side they decide to to give up that to vote for against the real uh, real how you're solving that problem as well. Yeah, thank you. Those are very good questions, and especially uh, in terms of a decentralized marketplace with an Oracle system, that will be key because the outcome is what's most interesting to anyone betting. Um, there will be a two-tier system for the actual Oracle, which will be done uh, by the expert as well. It will not be outsourced, the Oracle itself. Initially, based on many additional markets being available, some sets of data will be bought from central data providers, but over the long run, the idea is to use the own Oracle as the main source of outcomes apart from certain high velocity and high frequency markets where it might be difficult to apply that across the board. And the system will be that you'll have super users um, which will be based on the stakes in the platform uh, which will do the voting and the general community voting. In both of these instances there needs to be 70% majority reporting a certain outcome. If you reported another outcome instead of this which was uh, found as the truth by the 70%, all the stakes will be uh, wiped out. So. There is a negative incentive um, uh, to people um, not to report uh, wrong results. Um, the idea to try to game a system or try to use it to your advantage, it has always been there. And I think that's also a problem which you'll have with many other institutions. Uh, you'll have the 51% attacks or any kind of mining uh, superpower can actually get in and try to stake some uh, tokens and try to skew the system. But it is all based on the X token. And the X token value will only appreciate if actually the ecosystem will provide for a clean and uh, um, a well reporting system. Um, so if you do that, you'd have a very short term uh, gain of it, which wouldn't be interesting to all these super users because they stake already so many tokens that if they want to get rid of the tokens, it wouldn't be advantageous to them. Similar to miners uh, doing Ethereum mining, if they just crash the system or if, it, if they cause the fork of the system, uh, there, there wouldn't be any benefit to them. So of course there will be some instances where some people might try to um, uh, report some wrong results, but I think uh, not with 50, but 70%, there's a higher uh, threshold as well. And um, of course, um, if we see that there is a wrong result reported, people can challenge it, and then there will be still some repercussions based on reports where you have a system where you can complain basically as the community about the vote, uh, voting results. But there's a two-tiered structure, which means it's not only one instance, but even if you're a superpower and have the votes here, there would be another instance where it needs to be, where it needs to be reconfirmed as well. So I think it's a resilient system. It, I mean, it won't be perfect from the start. We'll see that there is some things uh, which need to be adjusted, but this will be a clear focus for the expert as well to make sure the Oracle system or the outcome voting system is working. And one more question. Yeah. How does the platform make money? So um, the question the, is how the platform makes yeah, money. Uh, how the platform makes money. Um, there is, um, fee structure for any kind of bets. Every market where you bet will have up to 4% charged in fees. Let's say there's a market about the World Cup, uh, who will win the World Cup, and it's a 10 million market, then there will be 4% for 100,000 which will be charged, which will return to the expat. The expat will pay this out in four different uh, installments or in four different shares. 25% will be uh, kept by the expat for maintenance of the platform, for development and uh, additional support. There will be 25% that will go to the market owner, created the market. So if you created the market about the World Cup winner and you provide certain liquidity, there's certain restrictions and rules, how liquid the market needs to be, how much you'll have to do for the market to be actually active. But you can get up to 1% as well, which will uh, equal to another 25% of if you take 100% as a total fee. 
Then 25% will go to the platform provider for the front end, uh, meaning there will be additional pages, additional sites, communities, forums, uh, apps where people will come to it because it will, in, like in almost no instance, people will go to the expat to go to the platform to do that, but they will use the decentralized outliers or uh, the feeding uh, platforms and they will also receive 25%. And the last 25% uh, will go to the outcome voting system where uh, you have 1% of the t uh, fee or 25% of what the expert has received um, given to the people participating in the outcome voting system to have the positive incentivization for it as well. So your company, you invested in that, uh, your fund yeah. invested in that. And uh, why aren't you with other investing equity in the company? We already invested equity as a seed investment, um, but uh, our fund doesn't do token investments. So uh, we do seed investments for startups to support them uh, initially, and apart from capital, also provide some strategic support, uh, especially since we are um, very well connected to the um, institutions in Malta. We know about the legal landscape, and uh, we have a very good uh, team behind us inside the group uh, to support with the go-to-market strategy. Uh, we are shareholders in some of the major uh, media companies in Europe to make sure that we can push them also in the market because key to the system working will be users coming onto the platform. You can have the best technologically advanced platform if it's not used by any party. If you don't have the customers on site, it will not work. So this is also where we provide additional benefit. So we come in very early on, support the project initially to kickstart it, help develop it initially with the first MEP, and also on the other hand, uh, provide them strategic services. But apart from that, uh, for the token issuance itself, it's not our investment focus. All right, cool. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for um, for your attention, for listening. Uh, we we prepared those um, fact sheets for each uh, project. So if you, I mean, these are uh, I would say you heard the presentations, and these are I would say you know filtered out, just information based uh, fact sheets that you know give you an objective opinion on the project. And we left some copies on the on the table. So if you'd like to see um, what how we pr present these projects and other projects, then you can feel free to pick up a, a copy. So thanks a lot again. Thank you.